Good morning, everyone. Uh, apologize about our glitch there with the technology. Just a heads up, sometimes when that does happen and it glitches like that, it'll kind of stay that way the entire service, and we have to do some work later on. So we'll see if the slides keep coming for you or if not, uh, but work with us on that. Uh, well, last week we were in John chapter 4. We'll be there again. So if you guys want to go ahead and turn there. And if you did, forgot your Bible, left it in the car, and would like to uh, have someone hand you one from the back, just lift your hand up, and we'll be glad to get you one of those. Uh, last week we were on John chapter 4, and we started verse 1 and went through verse 26. Uh, and we're there talking about the Samaritan woman. And just a quick overview to kind of catch you up. Here we have Jesus intentionally and deliberately. He's on his way to Galilee. He could have taken many routes, but uh, John records that he had to go to Samaria. He seems like he is on a mission, is very intentional, is very deliberate to go to Samaria. And obviously, as the story unfolds, we see that all of this was extremely intentional. It was not by accident. Our word is it was by purpose dent, all right? God does everything on purpose. And a little history on that Samaria. Um, if, you're, if you're a Bible student much at all, you, you've probably picked up on the fact that Jews did not like the Samaritans. And a little history there, if you go way back into the Old Testament, the book of Kings there, we see the divide, uh, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The ten tribes create the northern kingdom, uh, the southern uh, kingdom is made up of Judah and the smaller tribe Benjamin, and that's the way it exists. They have different kings, etc. Um, the, the northern tribes started their own form of worship, even though God did not prescribe them to build a temple or give them a high priest like he had done originally there with Israel, but they created their own rival, you might say, temple area. Uh, eventually, they continued to give themselves over, though, to idols, 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 until God sent the Assyrians in, in, I believe it was 722, to take them captive, leaving only in the Assyrian mind the worst of the worst uh, Israelites there, the ones that if they took them with them, it would be a, it would be a burden for the Assyrians to take captive. They took all the, the Israelites away, and they repopulated that area uh, where the northern kingdom was, uh, with people from all over that they had conquered before. So eventually you end up with a mixed people, which the, the Jews did not like, and you also you had a mixed religion. It was syncretization, all right, syncretism of differing religions, a little bit of God, a little bit of idols, and they created their own thing. So that uh, the entire area, that northern kingdom, basically becomes what is the Bible refers to as Samaria. And it was despised, it was hated by the Jews. And many would not even go into that area. They would try to walk around it. So when Jesus says he had to go to Samaria, it's very intentional. And he goes into Samaria and not just to, and, and doesn't just talk to a Samaritan. Even that was considered like no Jew would talk to a Samaritan. But he talks to not just a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman. And not just any Samaritan woman, this woman had five previous husbands and was living in adultery, living with her, another man at that time at the well. And as they begin to talk, Jesus offers her living water. And this is huge. This is tremendous. If we, we look back at Jeremiah, we looked at Isaiah. It's also over there at Ezekiel that the fountain of living water is God himself. So you have uh, this, this in itself is a claim to deity. You have Jesus who is offering living water. Uh, Jeremiah says that God is, is, is the fountain of living water. There in Jeremiah 2, uh, Jer uh, he's, God is speaking to the Israelites who are filling themselves with water from the world, and it was falling into broken cisterns. And we, we made a note that if your bucket has a hole in the bottom of it, it doesn't matter how much water you put in it, it will never fill up, right? Uh, but when you go to the fountain of living water, you are satisfied. But Israel kept going to the world. And we looked at this woman. She was doing that exact same thing. She was going to the world, trying to go a relationship after relationship, but it was never satisfying. She was looking in the wrong places. So Jesus offers her the living water. Uh, she goes on to, to try to, uh, to distract him after she, she, he mentions that she's in uh, five husbands and now has, is living with another guy to take the conversation away from her sin, if you remember, to the mountain controversy. So the you Jews worship over there, and us Samaritans worship over here. 
And we looked at that a little bit. The Samaritans had created their own spot of worship. They called this land holy, the primary place of worship, the only place they would go to worship. And the Jews went to the temple. And these were two big magnets for that area. And so she changes it to, you Jews say worship there, we say worship over here. But when the Christ comes, you know, he'll teach us all these things. And, and Jesus says, no, these, it does not matter anymore. The time is here and is coming for you must worship God in spirit and in truth. And Jesus is the, the apex of the truth of God. And that we must worship in spirit. It's not about the geographical location. You worship God in spirit. So he continues to elevate this teaching. Uh, and, and eventually she, she sees. She says, you must be the prophet. And the Samaritans only believed in the first five books of the Bible. So when they say that, that you are the prophet, when she says you are the prophet, they are, she is saying that you are the, the predicted one, the one that Moses said would come, the prophet. And Jesus says, I am that prophet, right? I am the Messiah. So huge statement there. And then he ends with saying, I am. He gives this great I am statement at the very end of that section we looked at, verse 26 last week. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he, is how it comes across in English. But this is one of the first I am statements of the book of John. It's that ego, ame, coming from Hebrew, from, John, from uh, Exodus chapter 3, where God reveals his name in the burning bush to Moses. And says, so Jesus is claiming that I am. I am deity. I am the fountain of living water. I am the Messiah. And I am. I am God. So a lot of huge statements there, all right? Now, let's uh, move on and pick up at verse 27 here. And just like last week, uh, this is a long narrative. So there's quite a bit of words here. We're not just picking one verse today and kind of diving into that. It is a narrative, so it does take more to develop the story. So today we'll go from verse 27 to 42. Let's look at that. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the sayings, saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have indeed sent the Messiah, you have sent the Savior of the world, the fountain of living water that brings true and lasting satisfaction to our souls. Help us, God, as we read through this, as we study this passage today, to even be reminded of last week that we should not go to the world for true, soul-satisfying, uh, thirst-quenching, that we'll never get it from this world, from relationships, to money, to things, to whatever this world has to offer us, God. Uh, it is a broken cistern that can never be filled, a bucket with holes at the bottom. Help us to see the world for what it is, and help us to see you for who you are, the source of living water, and we go to you today to drink and, 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 and to satisfy the thirst that we have, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, let's look back at verse 27 as we begin. So the disciples approach, all right? Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, 
What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So from this passage, uh, we see that there is some kind of shock, there's some kind of marvel going on that he is talking with a woman. So we see that that, even in general, was basically forbidden, especially if you are a rabbi. Rabbis, in general, the historians say, would not even talk to a woman, much less would they teach a woman theological matters. So this was something like was unheard of for other rabbis at that time. You have Jesus, who is the ultimate teacher, the ultimate rabbi, right, sent directly from God, who is God in the flesh, who has come to Samaria intentionally, deliberately, arrived at just the time which this pariah of the society, a woman who had five husbands living with another man, could not even come get water when the other ladies did, chose the middle of the day to come do such a thing. Jesus arrived right when she was there, and he's talking to her. His disciples come back from finding food. They see this. And interesting, if you look back at verse 27, uh, John intentionally says, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? So in other words, this is what they're thinking, but no one said these things actually to Jesus. So they're curious, but they don't talk about it. They're just remaining in shock that their rabbi is talking to a woman. Again, not just any woman. This is a Samaritan woman, and he's talking to her not just about simple things, but theological things he is talking to this woman about. So what is the result of, the, of Christ's encounter with this Samaritan woman at the well? We see in the following verse, not only does she believe, but she drops everything and goes and tells others as well. Look at verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now, this is really similar. I want you to look over at John chapter 1. Hold your place there. But look over at John chapter 1 and just, just, just refresh your memory on the verse 43 through verse, through verse 50. And you see so much similarity there uh, between this section and this section over here with the Samaritan sinning woman. Uh, but over here, you have the Jews. Just follow along. Look at verse 43. Uh, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was born in Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And we noted that that would be, he's speaking of the Messiah. When he says, we have found him in whom Moses in the law wrote about, that would also be what the Samaritan woman is referring to over here as the Messiah. Look at verse 46. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. This is very similar to the woman's response. If you look back at John chapter 4, verse 29, what does she say? She says, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. So she's, she's inviting others, come and see, come and see. And we took note there back on verse 46 on chapter 1 that Nathaniel uh, says this, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But instead of engaging him in this argument, Philip just diverts it and says, look, whatever, just come see, come see him, all right? Look at verse 47, chapter 1. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Now, go back over to, uh, to uh, chapter 4 there. But I just want to show you that. There's a very, there's, all these things are happening there with Philip and with Nathaniel are kind of compressed and open up over here in Samaria as well. You have the Samaritan woman who is doing the come and see, who is acting as evangelist, you might say now, the good news spreader, to come see Jesus. And uh, you also have this, this, this interesting reason that 
she now recognizes and sees Jesus as the Messiah and is based on his divine knowledge of her. Now, Nathanael was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. Why? Well, if you look back in verse 50, because I saw you under a fig tree. So Jesus uh, was not around Nathanael, but he is all-knowing. He knew he had been under a fig tree. Some theologians speculate that it was a common place to sit, to meditate, to pray to God. Fig trees have big leaves. They put out a nice little shade, nice little canopy, plus there's a little snack there as well, all right? Um, but a lot of people would sit and then underneath and pray. So when Jesus says, I, I saw you under the fig tree, and Nathaniel is blown away, he's completely mesmerized and says, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Why? Because he has divine knowledge, supernatural knowledge. Over here with the Samaritan woman, we see the same thing taking place, except she gives a reason that come see the man who knew everything I've ever done. Well, what do we know about what she's ever done so far? It's not that she was sitting under a fig tree praying. It's like the opposite. You're living with a man who's not your husband. You had five husbands before that. And so you have that very similar situation, but over here when he's calling out Nathaniel, it says, look, an Israelite indeed, this, uh, in whom there is no deceit. And Jesus had saw him praying under the fig tree. Here, the Samaritan woman, she's saying, look, come see him, not because I was praying under a fig tree, but because he knows everything about me. And he listed all of my sins right before him. And yet, this is the one who is the prophet. This is the one who is the Messiah. And he's kept on speaking to me. Now, most of you are from larger towns now, but if many of you are from smaller towns, my town population, I think, is like 1,600 now. It used to be much bigger. It was like uh, 1,900 when I was a kid. But it's uh, gone down a little bit over time. And uh, so if you're in a small town, everybody knows everything about each other, right? And, and you know if someone is in your town and has been married five times, it's not a secret and you know who's living with who, and you know who's sin. It, it's just everyone knows, right? So when she comes back running through the town, come see this one who could be the Christ who told me everything I've ever done. This is her acknowledging, admitting, like, you guys know who I am. No one even talks to me, but yet this one who is the Messiah sat and talked with me, and you guys need to hear what he has to say as well. So several things we learn from the Samaritan woman's response uh, to Jesus. Let's look at those quickly and, and, and truly try to apply these to our lives. Uh, number one, she expressed a love of others by trying to get them to the Messiah. She could have sat there. She could have listened and walked away back to her home and never told anyone. But that's not what people do when they have good news. What do people do when they have good news? They tell other people, especially if you love someone. Uh, and here's we see, a, it looks like a heart change has happened. She goes back into the town. She is expressing love by trying to get them back to the Messiah. The same reason Philip had gone to Nathaniel, because he loved him, right? We have love of others. And it's something to think about. Since your salvation, what have you done to get people to the Messiah, uh, the most loving thing you can do for anyone is to share the gospel of salvation with them. And here we have this woman who is, who is extremely sinful, uh, is given grace, and she immediately wants to, others to receive this grace as well. And this is what, the way we need to be. Uh, number two, she did what she could do with the knowledge that she had. Uh, think about that for a moment. You, you, so many times we reserve the evangelism, reserve telling others about Jesus Christ only for licensed and ordained pastors or official evangelists that can do such a thing. And, and here this woman, is, she's called right in her sin. Jesus speaks with her. She believes and immediately goes into the town and gets other people to come see Jesus. She does not know everything. I guarantee you 99% of you in this room know more about Christ, know more about theology than this woman did. But if you compared how many people you've witnessed to to how many people she's witnessed to, she might very well be in the lead. Uh, the point is, 
that we, we sometimes, sadly, uh, reserve. We have to know everything about the Bible, have it all figured out, have all questions uh, answered and put checks in every box, and be basically all knowing of the Bible before we can tell anyone about Jesus. When we have to remember the quick, simple, come see. This is how Philip got Nathaniel. This is how the woman got her whole town to Jesus, right? But she told them what she could say. She told them what she had. So this is another good point that needs to be applied as well. Uh, too many Christians just reserve this, and they focus on what they do not know as an excuse not to share the gospel or not to talk about Christ. Number three, uh, the woman at the well immediately began to tell others about the Messiah. Uh, she wasn't just, you see, unbelief to belief to telling others about Jesus Christ. And uh, it's, it's just, again, don't put evangelism into the far-off, never-arriving future, but do this. Like, that you care about people? Do you love people? Is the gospel good news? Yes, yes, and yes. Is hell hot? Is heaven real? Uh, yes. Is, is there punishment for sin? Is the wrath of God coming? Uh, yes. Is there salvation only found in the Messiah, in the Son of God? Yes. Then this needs to be known. Uh, she immediately begins to tell others. Uh, number four, she was excited to share this information with others. She did not begrudgingly go. It was like, this is wonderful. This is amazing. I have been shown grace. I need to tell others. And this is beautiful. And you really see, it's a verse you looked at in discipleship last week. But look over at Romans chapter 10, verse 12 through 15. Romans 10, verse 12 through 15. It really sounds so much um, like Paul's uh, teaching here to the Romans. And Paul, of course, is quoting from the Old Testament as well. But you have, you have her feet, which she is excited. Uh, her feet are beautiful because she's bringing good news in. Uh, the words that are coming out of her mouth are beautiful because she's speaking about the Messiah. And it sounds very much like Paul is talking about over here in Romans. Look at verse 12. He says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him on whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This Samaritan woman had beautiful feet. Why did she have beautiful feet? Because she had a beautiful message. And she was bringing this message back to her town. And again, there's so much there we need to apply to our lives about her story. How can people, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So again, we, we notice this is not just the Jewish Messiah. This is the, the Messiah for the whole world, as we're, we're covering in this passage that we're covering today, even to the, the Jewish mind, the scummiest, the worst people on earth, this mixed genealogy, this syncretized religion, these idolatry, uh, people involved in idolatry, this woman who's had five husbands living in adultery, she can be saved like I know we're saved by grace, but that's a little too much grace, all right? And not only her, but the whole town of them, this, this is just too much grace. Uh, the disciples are definitely being discipled today. They're definitely being taught here uh, in this scene. But here you have this beautiful Romans passage. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they believe if they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone telling them? This woman took it to heart. You know how they're going to believe? They need to hear. You know who's going to tell them? It's going to be me. I am going to take this personally. I'm not going to leave the water and go sit and pray for God to send someone else to the town. I am going to right now stand up, and I'm going to go get them. I'm going to open my mouth and walk with my beautiful feet with a beautiful message and get people to Jesus, all right? So you see this woman fulfilling and truly becoming uh, up until this time, you might say, next to John the Baptist, this is the largest record of, of someone spreading the news and drawing people to Jesus that we have. And you have 
not the Israelite of Israelites, like Nathaniel doing this, or not a John the Baptist, but this woman, a Samaritan woman, who is doing such a thing. Um, a couple of points as we, we reflect on that. Uh, you never know the influence you can have on multitudes of people by sharing Christ with one person. And even here today, you could be thinking on this, like, how have you been saved? How has your family been saved? Uh, was there someone who led your father to Christ or your mother to Christ or your, your grandparents or your great-grandparents, all right? How, how generations can be changed and rearranged because of one stranger that witnesses to you, perhaps. So never underestimate the power of one to reach multitudes. Uh, if God could use this sinful woman to transform a city, then he can certainly use you. A lifetime adulterer who is immediately changed, rearranged, and becomes beautiful feet with a beautiful message and getting people back to the Messiah. Also, as we look at this, uh, think on this as well, uh, on God's knowledge of sin. Uh, before we leave this passage, it's important to acknowledge that Jesus, is, Jesus knew this woman's sin without having to be told. Uh, Jesus knows all sins without having to be told. You think of David, right? David says, where can I go that I can hide from you? N nowhere. Uh, you're with me when I rise, when I wake up. If I go here, you're there, there. Think of Jonah. Where could Jonah go to hide from God? Uh, there is nowhere that he could go to hide from God, right? We can't go anywhere either. Uh, where did Adam and Eve go after they had sinned against God? Uh, fig leaves. He can't see through fig leaves. That's going to really cover us up, I bet, right? I'll hide behind a bush. No, there's no place you can hide your sins from God. Uh, he knows perfectly well who this woman is, and it makes no sense for her or for us to attempt to hide something from God who already knows every detail about it. The proper response to sin is always to confess. That means the same speak of it as God speaks of it and repent of that sin. Uh, God knows that you have sinned. You know that you have sinned. Why try to hide sin from the only one who can forgive sin? Well, our he, Jesus is not only God in the flesh. He is not only the king of Israel. He's not only the son of God, but he is the only one that can forgive you of your sin. So don't try to hide the sin. Confess, repent, go to Jesus for forgiveness. Uh, so a lot is going on here. Let's move on to verse 31. Meanwhile, and I'll back to the disciples, okay? We're kind of going back and forth. This woman is doing her thing. The disciples are like, no, you got to eat. You got to eat, Jesus, eat. And he's like, I'm doing something bigger here. Look at verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So here we see these the disciples go from marveling that he's talking to a Samaritan woman about theological matters. To, they know he's famished. Uh, he's got to eat. They're like, you, you need to eat. Uh, how does Jesus read? respond to this urging of food he tells them he elevates the conversation he says i'm doing something far more important here and you're trying to get me to eat food and basically what they're doing they're still ignoring the woman they're ignoring that the messiah is talking to the woman and they're trying to get jesus just to eat the food and it's probably what is going on here to a degree is uh the disciples have gone off to get food. It is a long journey. There's not lots of fast food restaurants and Chick-fil-A's along the side, right? So they finally arrive through the desert, through a desolate area. They are famished. They have gone into town to gather food. They have come back out. And out of respect for their rabbi, for their teacher, they are not going to eat until he eats something first. And so they're like, Rabbi, eat <laughs> please eat you need this for your own good as well as us you know we are all hungry at this point so they're urging him to eat look at verse 33 so the disciples said to one another has anyone brought him something to eat jesus said to them my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work so now they're like, okay, he's not eating. He's not as hungry as we are. Surely something else has, has cured his hunger. Maybe, maybe the woman brought him food as well. But again, in verse 34, he elevates the conversation. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. 
And this is a, a quote out of Deuteronomy. Turn there with me. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. There's two times here that, that they're recorded where Jesus quotes this. This will be one of them. They're trying to get Jesus to eat food. And at that moment, he is striving to obey his heavenly father. But the, in their mind, as often as in our mind, the most important thing at a moment can be food, right? How many of you get hangry? Don't answer out loud. All right. But it's like you go an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, you might get quite irritable. And your whole focus of your life becomes food, food, food. And this was happening to the disciples. But in Jesus' mind, there was something more important. It was honoring, obeying uh, God. Uh, look at Deuteronomy 8, uh, verses 1 through 3. We'll see where this, is, this, first, this passage is quoted from. Uh, the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land the Lord sworn to give your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord, your God, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and, and, and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know the man, that man does not live on bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the Father's mouth. So here we have this, this is, seems to be what Jesus is reply, or, or talking about when he quotes this, or alludes to this, to his disciples. Uh, Moses here is making the same point, that there's something even greater, even more necessary, even more needed for food. And if you look back at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, it's the obedience to God. These things that I command you to do today, you shall be careful to do. That obedience to God is even more pleasurable, even more desirable, even more satisfying than, the, than eating of the bread, than just filling our stomachs with food. And so here, you know, verse 3, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8, it says, man, uh, the, a man shall not live on bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the Father's mouth. And again, we need to apply this to our lives. You should have a hunger to know God and to live for God that surpasses all other desires on this earth. Even walking through a desert, even being famished, there's still something greater. Uh, where else does Jesus, Jesus cite this passage? Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. And it's the, the temptation, right, where Satan is tempting Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. In this, we see that Jesus has been uh, without food for 40 days, not 40 minutes. That's right, 40 days, all right? And he is truly famished, truly exhausted, and Satan comes along to tempt him with food. And we see that we see this great dichotomy here. If you compare this scene, it's not really the focus of the message today, but, but if you compare this to Adam and Eve when they are tempted, they are in a paradise. Where is Jesus when he's being tempted? He is in a desert. Uh, they are in a buffet. Uh, there, there's every food you can imagine there for them, hanging off the trees. Everything is growing easily. All they have to do is not eat one, the, one from this one tree, right? Uh, Jesus has no food around at all. They have each other. They have company. Jesus is by himself. There is no one else around, and Satan comes to tempt him. They had just eaten. Uh, there's food all around. Jesus has not eaten in 40 days. So it's like, wow, this big difference, okay? Satan came to Adam, came to Eve. They fell immediately. Uh, Satan comes to Jesus, and he says there's something more pleasurable than any food you can offer. What is that? What could be more pleasurable than food after you've gone 40 days with none of it? Look what he says, verse 2. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Wow. Wow. So it is, it is, it's kind of possible to put ourselves in the shoes, it's still hard to even do that, of the disciples who had gone through a desert, 
who had gone quite a long time without food, possibly water as well. Uh, but here, I mean, that's, this is unheard. 40 days, right? 40 days, yet when Jesus is tempted, he says, no, it's more pleasurable. I have more desire to obey God than to even eat the food that you're trying to offer me. So what is greater than food? Obedience to God. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying it to his disciples. He's saying it to Satan as well. All right, so let's look back at verse 35, John chapter 4, verse 35. What is the work then that Jesus is saying, no, not food. I am here to obey God. I'm here to do this work. What is the work that he is there to accomplish? Remember, he's come to Samaria intentionally, deliberately, after this sinner to, to talk with her, and he is doing that right now. The work is the harvest, and he answers that here in verse 35. Look at verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. So Jesus here draws another analogy to something that's very practical. He talked about water versus living water. He talked about, talking about food versus, versus feeding from the word of God, feeding, feeding on the word of God, right? And now he's saying, hey, look up and see this harvest. I mean, they're, they're bringing him sardines and telling him to eat, and he's saying, open your eyes. Look around. Do you see the harvest? And they're like, ah, oh, just eat. We're starving. Come on. But he's saying, no, you look, look, look at the harvest. It's all around us. So what is he saying? He even says, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. What's this talking about? Well, he's talking about literal at this time. Uh, the harvest was extremely important in that society and in that culture, now we live in a world where you go to your grocery store and they basically have the same food supply all year around because it's coming from all over the U.S. and all over the world so that if you want food, it's just there. It was not the same in that day. And the harvest day, the harvest time was extremely important. And it was on everyone's mind. It was on everyone's thoughts. And it was common vernacular for people to discuss when the harvest day is coming. So how would you know that the crops were ready for harvest? Uh, they would change shape. They would change colors, and the wheat would become white up top. So it was very obvious to the eyes. So Jesus is saying, look, don't say four months and then the harvest. He's bringing it back to where he's at now and spiritualizing this. He's saying, look, right now is the time of harvest. And they've just come from all this way. They know it's not harvest time. So what's he talking about? Obviously, he's... he's not talking about the crop, he's talking about people, he's talking about Samaritans specifically, that right here, right where they're at, they're focused on the sardines and making sure Jesus eats, he's like, no, there's greater work to be done, in fact, it's being done right now, and you're so distracted with temporary things that you're missing it all, uh, so what is this harvest? Samaritans, where is the woman just gone, just taking the good news? And she's running through Samaria, and Jesus is aware and seeing it all. And he's trying to tell them, open up your eyes. See everything that's uh, taking place. Yes, you saw me talking to a woman about salvation, theological matters, offering her living water, a Samaritan. Yes, and yes, she just dropped everything and took off. Look at what's going on, and yet you're so focused on eating this food, right? So questions we could ask ourselves: do you see the harvest that lies before you? Are you so distracted by temporary things that you can't see what is most important? And this is, a, this is a constant battle for us in life. Life is highly distracting. We are basic needs, always thirsty, always hungry, right? You're kind of, Jesus is doing this great work right in front of their eyes, and that they're focused on the fish, focused on the sardines, focused on that food. Eat this, eat this, eat this. And they're, they're completely distracted. Jesus is all about the work of the work of his heavenly father. His disciples don't see any of it. So this is something we need to be aware of as well. Don't focus on just the temporary, just the material. But open up your eyes and see, as Jesus would see if he was here right now, look at the harvest, right? There is, it is ripe for the pickings. What do they need? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
But how can they believe if they have not heard? How can they hear unless you open your mouth and you get your feet going and share this beautiful news, right? So he's saying it, it's time right now. Um, and taking this to heart, it is easy to scoff at the disciples, uh, but we should certainly be careful not to overlook ourselves at this. It's easy to look at them and go, oh, these imbeciles. And then you look in the mirror and go, ah, oh, you imbecile. <laughs> You're right. It's, we're in the same boat. How often do we get so consumed with the temporary things of life that we fail to see the harvest that is directly before our eyes? Uh, so that we, this is something we need to take to heart. The disciples were, were so distracted, they didn't see what the greater work was being done. Look at verse 36, chapter 4, John. Already, Jesus goes on to say, the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So again, it's agricultural analogy, right? If you're a sower, uh, it is not like needle and thread. Just to be very basic, you are planting seeds in the ground. Who is the reaper? That is the one who comes along at the harvest, and reaps the crop, all right, at the time of the harvest. Uh, so, so here we see that Jesus is, is drawing out this agriculture analogy, but is comparing it to the work of the Lord. Uh, God had sovereignly planted here in Samaria, and now they needed a reaper. And he's saying, look, it, the, something greater has arrived, and it's not lunchtime. It is harvest time. And right now, it is happening. Uh, the sower and the reaper. There is a lady running through town, and there is about to be a great harvest. Uh, the fields are white. There, it is ready to go. We just need laborers. You have just entered in where others have sown, and you're about to reap the harvest right before your eyes. So who was the sower that he's talking about? It's a little hard to determine, but it, it could be. Uh, it very well could be the woman. Because she could be the woman who is sowing. She's going through. And, and now the disciples have just come up out of nowhere, and they are about to reap what this woman has sown. She is planting the seeds. But the, and the point of this is also sowers and reapers work together. And this is an extremely important concept. Jesus is talking about it here. Also, we see Paul talking about it. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4 through 9. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4 through 9. All right, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4 through 9. Paul says, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, so he's the sower, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. We are all God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So what do we see in this passage? Very similar to what Jesus is speaking about over here. Uh, They're both servants of God. You have the Samaritan woman who appears to be sowing. Uh, you have the disciples who are coming up who are about to reap. Uh, who gets the greater reward? They are both doing the work of the Lord. Uh, it's extremely important. She didn't know everything, but she knew enough that this was good. And she was getting people back to Jesus, back to the disciples, and they were about to see a great harvest take place right then and there. So this is that, that teamwork. It's uh, Christians doing everything that they can do to get people to Jesus, to get the gospel to them. Some are sowing, some are planting. Who is involved in all of this? God. God is causing it to grow. God is sovereign over the entire process. That's what we see in Samaria. How did she hear the good news? God is sovereign over everything. Jesus had to go to Samaria. It wasn't by happenstance he ended at the well and there happened to be this woman there. Everything was according to God's time. 
she begin to sow. The disciples come up, and they're about to reap this beautiful harvest. Look back at verse 39 in John chapter 4. We'll read through verse 42 and wrap this section up in John. And now this wonderful news, verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is, of, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This is amazing. How Jesus comes, talks with the the, 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 the worst possible person he could speak to in the Jewish mind. She believes, goes through the town. They come out. They believe now. And now you have a town transformed. Again, you never can uh, know the power of witnessing to, to one person. Now you have a town that is transformed. Uh, the disciples learned some valuable lessons that day, and we should as well. Uh, people are truly saved by grace. And if God can save this woman and turn her into this powerful voice and powerful feet with this beautiful message to bring people to him, uh, he can save anyone. You think of this woman. She is, she is right in the middle of her sin. She's right in the middle of living in sin, and yet God rescues her out of that sin. It reminds me of even Paul, who is on his way right in the middle of his sin, to arrest more Christians and get them, drag them out of their homes, men and women, and he is radically saved by Jesus Christ. He goes back into that town and, and immediately starts preaching that Jesus actually is the Christ, right? So you have something very similar here happening in Samaria. She is right in the middle of her sin. She is radically saved. We are saved by grace, true grace, grace alone. Uh, the disciples could probably think of no one lower than this woman, and yet God gave her grace. She becomes a tremendous witness that leads many others to coming to Christ. And uh, they, they had to be quite stunned. If you think about the book of John, how it's developed, uh, we spent a lot of time over there in chapter 3. Uh, you might say the, the main star of that, of course, next to Christ, would be Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was the who's who in the Jewish culture. He was famous. He was the teacher of Israel. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. They were also a Pharisee. Pharisee. He was a, a wealthy man, we come to find out as well, and lived a very outwardly, at least, holy life to be in that position. Jesus speaks with him, and Nicodemus goes his own way. All right, and this is the who's who. Oh, it does look like he does later come to faith, but this is the who's who and no response. Jesus comes into Samaria, spends a little bit of time with this Samaritan woman, and it's all out, you might call revival, taking place from her. Uh, the totally different response than the, the Jew of Jews over there in chapter 3. Uh, Jesus is not only the Savior of the Jews, but here the disciples see something. It's going to take them a while to process, but he is truly the Savior of the world. He is not there for just Israel he is not there for just the 12 tribes of Israel, but he is there, as Paul pointed out, for the Jews and Greeks, but also the everything that is in between, even in their mind, the worst of the worst, the Samaritans. He is spending time with them. They're believing in him. And look what they acknowledge at the end of this verse 42, that he is the savior of the world. Wow. They're fully acknowledging that he is the savior of the world. So you have lots of great things that are, that are added to. John is, John is recording these things. He's teaching these things so that we might believe, and that by believing we might have eternal life. What big things has he revealed here in chapter 4? That the, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the fountain of living water. That Jesus knows sin that Jesus is the giver of grace, that Jesus is the forgiver of all sin, that he is indeed the savior of the world. And what are we supposed to do with that? Embrace that, receive that grace, receive him as the savior, and then look around. This is good news. The harvest is all around. What are we supposed to do? Tell them about Jesus Christ. 
Well, there's a lot here for us to think about today. But if God can use a Samaritan woman with just a little bit of knowledge to transform a town, what can he do with you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great, inspiring story of a person who is radically changed as you expose her to her sin. Uh, and she's radically changed, is, is saved by grace, and continues through the town to get others out to the Messiah. Lord, help us to apply these things to our life. Help us to, to be a witness as she was. She had no big formal training uh, no big great seminars that she had gone to, or not even any fancy tracks or books to hand out or anything like that. She just spent a little time with Jesus, and she was moved. She was changed, and she, out of her love of others, she wanted to get them the good news as quickly as she possibly could. God, help us to look around and, and not be uh, distracted like the disciples were uh, by temporary things, but help us to see the harvest is ready. Uh, the white is on the top of the plants. It is ready for harvest. Uh, others have sown, and it's time to reap. God, help us to not be shy with the gospel, that you can reach someone like her. Uh, I think the disciples were learning a lesson that day that you can reach anyone, and help us to remember that. Uh, sinners are sinners. They are not saints. They are sinners uh, that need the gospel. They can be saved. They will be saved. They can be changed and rearranged. And it is our duty to get the gospel to them for salvation. Lord, help us be inspired by, uh, by her and by her feet and by her message that she, and her love of others that she was willing to get the gospel to them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.